Nature is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Your gas company and America's natural gas industry. Developing new ways to use clean gas energy to generate electricity and fuel vehicles to help meet America's goal for cleaner air. Siemens, a whole new world of ideas in electronics and electrical engineering. Siemens, precision thinking. And by Canon, quality and innovation for the way we work and live. Canon. Between Australia and the equator, a rugged mountain range reaches up out of the sea. Few outsiders have crossed its beaches to enter its once dark and dangerous heartland. This was a land of cannibals and headhunters. Its name is New Guinea, the largest tropical island on Earth. It's a land so unexpected that glaciers top its peaks while coral reefs ring its shores. Its mountains are so impassable that a thousand different languages are spoken by the people of the interior. In our next two programs, nature explores a land hidden from the outside world. In fact, our filmmakers were the first to capture a sacred Stone Age ritual. Join us for this portrait of the bizarre and the beautiful. In 1926, news broke in Australia that gold was found up north on the island of New Guinea. Adventurous young men set sail and crossed the sea to a land they had never seen before. They made small settlements along the coast. Few wanted to journey inland, where mountains were dangerously steep, where dense jungle and deep swamp swallowed up the foolhardy, where a man could collapse from heat stroke or freeze to death from the cold. New Guinea is an island of extremes. Just east of Asia, due north of Australia, New Guinea sits between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. It is the second largest island in the world. It is also one of the last places on Earth to be touched by European invaders. The island presents formidable obstacles of swamps, mountains, and weather. Only a few men were willing to enter this fearful territory. One of them was Mick Leahy, an Australian prospector. He wrote in his journal, after a few hours walk, sheer walls of limestone dropped 100 feet. We were devoured by millions of mosquitoes. We were badly in need of a rest from the blood-sucking leeches, lawyer vines, and stinging trees. But beyond the hills, this strange and frightening terrain also holds an Eden. Creatures both rare and beautiful flourish in this exotic landscape, and there are powerful spirits in this forest. The natives believe that spirits circle the sky as bats or birds. or fly across the ocean. There are many animal spirits, but it's the bird of paradise to whom the native people pay special attention. When a spirit wants to speak, it enters a bird of paradise and uses the bird's voice to call to its relatives in the forest. <laughs> 
The newcomers, however, saw this place as anything but a paradise. The terrain of most of the island dashed any hopes of an easy exploration. If these impassable stretches of boiling mud didn't shake them up, the earthquakes did. Volcanoes created rows of islands in the Pacific, including New Guinea. These islands are scattered up to the Philippines, all the way to Japan. The volcanoes are still active today. Molten rock churning far below escapes to the surface and mixes with water. The result, hot, bubbling mud. At times, that volcanic power erupts and shakes this island, thrusting it ever closer to the sky. The tranquil coastline belies the turmoil that created it. Consumed with their quest for gold, white prospectors gave little thought to what lay beyond the shore or beneath the waters. They would have found a diver's paradise. For underwater wildlife, the location of New Guinea could not be better. Its placement at a major marine crossroads between the Indian and Pacific Oceans means life can sweep in from all directions. The waters of New Guinea have yet to be fully explored. But already, we know these coral reefs to be among the richest on Earth. The graceful wings of the lionfish are actually sharp spines loaded with deadly poison. Clownfish use the stinging tentacles of anemones for protection. These shallow, warm waters are ideal for both partners. Some species of clownfish are found nowhere else in the world. Clownfish have developed a way to avoid being stung the fish does an elaborate dance, carefully smearing mucus from the anemone over its body. Since the anemone doesn't sting itself, it won't sting a fish covered in its own slime. This mantis shrimp is on the lookout for a good home. The base of the reef seems ideal. Not only beautiful, the mantis is well protected. The claws it keeps tucked under its body can easily break a person's fingers. Another creature finds a hiding place, this time in these red gorgonians. Within them are razor fish, swimming in this curious way to disguise themselves against the vertical stalks. These fish have also sought refuge among spines, but they haven't noticed that the spines are not attached to a rock but to a very hungry stonefish.
they make the fatal mistake of coming too close. Six hundred species of nudibranch thrive in one lagoon in New Guinea. This diversity is unheard of anywhere else. Their colorful coats are attractive, and their slow pace makes them a tempting meal for a fish. But looks can be deceiving. The nudibranchs eat coral polyps, which give them either a nasty taste or the ability to sting. The nudibranch is a mollusk without a shell. Its name means naked lung. The feathery decorations above its tail are actually gills. A trigger fish finds what looks like an easy meal. And discovers the nudibranch's foul taste. This collection of sea life is massive, a collage of color and conflict. The undersea landscape is extraordinary as well. To go to New Guinea and not look at its waters is like going to Arizona and not looking at the Grand Canyon. A diver's light reveals a sea fan. It glows a delicate pink when lit. Normally, it would be invisible in the mouth of this dark cave. And near the surface, almost every rock is smothered with coral. These reefs have been affected by the same forces that built the mainland. Earthquakes have pushed some of them above the surface of the sea creating coral islands that have been colonized by plants. These terraces were once coral reefs. They were slowly pushed out of the water by the collision of the Pacific seafloor with the crust of New Guinea. This continuous collision gives birth to the island's volcanoes. The combination of towering mountains and a tropical sea means only one thing. Rain and lots of it. Thunderstorms occur almost every afternoon. In some parts of New Guinea, rainfall is 20 feet a year. These torrential rains wash organic matter off the slopes, down the streams, and into the sea. The abundance of these nutrients fertilizes an already rich sea life. This channel in a barrier reef on the northern coast is called the Magic Passage. The numbers and varieties of sea life which gather here to feed on the passing plankton give the channel its name.
Where the current is at its strongest, a perpetual underwater hurricane has swept the seafloor clear of coral. Garden eels have taken over the sandy basin. They're tiny, barely half a foot long. They rely on the swift current to bring them food because they rarely leave their burrows. They're quick and with their sharp eyes can look out for food and potential predators. A school of barracuda. A white-tipped reef shark. Beyond the reef, the water drops off several hundred feet, and larger ocean hunters come up out of the blue. A scalloped hammerhead, 14 feet long. But ocean wanderers did not just come from below. The origins of these people are not known for sure, but it's thought they came from Asia 50,000 years ago, crossing the open water on canoes and rafts. They island hopped from the Indonesian archipelago to New Guinea. The people today are divided into three groups, the Melanesians, the Papuans, and the Negritos. Although Europeans had known of this island since 1512, they didn't settle here. The original people of New Guinea lived in virtual isolation until the 20th century. While the rest of the world developed new technologies, the people of New Guinea lived and prospered in the Stone Age. Those who settled along the coast would never go hungry. Sea life in the lagoons was plentiful and the crops were generous. Volcanic ash makes the soil extremely fertile and the farmers grow bananas, coconuts, sugarcane, and sweet potato all year long. New Guineans utilize the entire banana tree. They harvest the stalks and fibers and use the fronds to carry food. Eating the banana itself was once taboo. Warriors would not eat a banana before a battle. They believed the fruit's softness would diminish their strength. The coconut, like the banana, is used for more than food. Its wood, leaves, and fibers are transformed into utensils, vessels, even homes. Today, the island is divided into two countries. Irian Jaya in the west is a province of Indonesia. Papua New Guinea in the east is an independent country. But throughout the island, each coastal village, each mountain valley contains a separate, unique culture. Because of the isolated pockets of people, almost a thousand different languages are spoken in New Guinea. These are the Mount Hagen Highlanders. The Dani people from Irian Jaya. Huli Wigman 
from the highlands. And I am tribesman from the coastal swamp. Although humans migrated to New Guinea from Asia, most animals could not. The only other mammal that came from Asia flew. Bats fill the skies of New Guinea. Some native people believe these large, graceful creatures are spirits and should not be killed or eaten. Should they kill them, they too would die. Bats arrived in large numbers and once here, evolved into a great variety of forms. This is one of the island's biggest bats, a spectacle flying fox, a fruit bat with a wingspan of more than three feet. New Guinea has 50 different species of fruit bats alone. These bats are voracious vegetarians. The natives need to guard their farms and gardens against these armies of the night. By midday, the sun's heat is intense. Wing flapping helps cool their bodies. Once they're comfortable, they fold their wings into sunshades. They need to rest in preparation for the night of feeding ahead. When the sun starts to set, the bats rise to the skies. Their search for food may take them more than 30 miles before dawn. other mammals to migrate to New Guinea did not fly, they walked. 8,000 years ago, there was a land bridge to Australia, the Torres Strait. At that time, the Torres Strait was a great swampy plain like this, that stretched unbroken between New Guinea and the Australian continent but the rising sea level submerged the land bridge and the connection between the two countries was severed. Many Australian animals were stranded on New Guinea. Immigrants easily adapted to their new homeland, like the wallaby. The open savannas along the southern coast are very similar to their native Australia. In the dry season, the sun bakes the ground hard. Rain doesn't fall for months. The hungry wallabies search for anything green. At midday, they seek shelter from the blazing sun, 
Even the breeze is hot and withering. A wallaby baby called a joey is born the size of a postage stamp. The mother carries it in her pouch until it's eight months old. Then it's big enough to get around on its own. To overcome the heat, wallabies lick their forearms. The evaporating saliva helps cool them down. Wallabies were very important in the rituals of the native people. In a bridal ceremony, a man could offer a wallaby as a gift to his prospective family. Wallabies don't have to worry about large mammal predators like tigers or lions. None ever made it to New Guinea. Instead, some of the largest, most fearful predators are reptiles. This is an amethystine python, more than 12 feet long from nose to tail, another immigrant from Australia. The python lies in wait for its prey, then kills it with suffocation. Remarkably, it can swallow a small wallaby whole. Some reptiles specialize in hunting other reptiles. This is not a snake, but a legless lizard, and it's looking for a smaller lizard to eat. But first, a drink of dew. Skinks are difficult to catch because they're alert, nervous animals. For these lizards, legs would be a handicap. By gliding silently through the grass, they're able to sneak up on their unsuspecting prey. But the predator that rules this island is a creature from the age of dinosaurs. This is Salvadori's monitor, the world's longest lizard. 12 feet in length with fast moving claws and razor sharp teeth, it doesn't hesitate to lunge at prey twice its size. Salvadori's monitor is found only in New Guinea, sharing the island with six other species of big monitor lizard. It's because New Guinea has no large carnivorous mammals that these dragons rule on. It's a powerful hunter, but it won't pass up an easy meal like this wallaby carcass. Their thick protective skin allows them to withstand the long dry season in the savanna. Despite their bulk, they are good swimmers and are as agile in the water as on the land. This one uses its tongue to pull odors from the air. It smells a meal. The dry season is hard on the wallabies, but a time of plenty for the monitor. It boldly takes possession of another carcass. The dry season lingers on. 
lakes and rivers become shallower, smaller. As the pools shrink, many different flocks are forced to gather, their numbers reaching in the thousands. These magpie geese are searching for tender aquatic plants, but the herons and egrets are hunting for something meatier. Stranded eels stand little chance against the great white heron's keen eye and sharp bill. During the wet season, the savanna was flooded, but now that water levels have dropped, eels, frogs, and fish become trapped, creating a bonanza of food. Terns and cormorants join in the feast. At the water's edge, shrimp and other aquatic life have been left high and dry. Easy pickings for the long probing bill of the glossy ibis. Many types of birds come only here to feed, like this elegant Brolga crane. <laughs> Hundreds of catfish are trapped in a quiet backwater and become a feast for Australian pelicans. Working in teams, they're able to catch fish with almost every scoop. In this remote and isolated area, human interference is minimal. Because it's relatively safe, birds congregate here in enormous numbers. But there is danger here from the sky, a white-bellied sea eagle. Its presence makes these whistling ducks nervous and flighty. Their sudden takeoff alarms other birds and there's a mass exodus.
New Guinea has some of the world's most spectacular rivers. There are hundreds of waterways, and local people use them as highways. The rivers are natural routes to the interior, and in the 1930s, a few brave explorers tried to use them to reach the central mountains. The mightiest and most traveled river is this, the Sepik. The Sepik River flows across both Erie and Jaya and Papua New Guinea. Stretching 700 miles across the northern coast, it's one of the world's largest rivers. It's also one of the youngest, 6,000 years old. This immense tangle of waterways spelled disaster to early adventurers. They often got lost. One of the first pilots who flew across this landscape was dismayed by what he saw. He wrote, waters threaded these wastes in a bewildering maze. It might have been a Martian landscape with a complex system of canals. The river's hairpin bends and oxbow lakes can still confuse the inexperienced navigator. But the native people are at home on these waters. They effortlessly travel the twisted canals. They fish, cook, and even raise their families on this floating world. The catfish sustains them, and these fishermen hunt for it in the traditional way, stalking it with a harpoon. Lately, they've accepted more modern methods like nylon nets. Besides catfish, the Sepik River provides eels, crayfish, snails, and a continual harvest of water lilies. In the last few years, a fish called tilapia, an African species, was introduced. It was hoped that this fish would cut down on the mosquito population. It didn't. But the tilapia has prospered, providing good harvests and plenty of protein for the river people. On these fishing expeditions, Sepik women are away from their villages for several days. They spend so much time on the water that every aspect of their lives has been modified to take place in a small canoe. Animals, however, don't need a canoe. Home-crested jacanas spend their entire lives walking upon the water lilies. When excited, they blush, their yellow combs turning dark red. The beautiful pygmy goose feeds on the river surface and rarely comes ashore. When it does leave the water, it perches in trees, a trait which is very rare in waterfowl.
Life for these northern river people looks idyllic, but it's not. The constant threat of floods, tribal disputes, and illnesses, such as malaria, make their life uncertain. So they appeal to the water spirit. The deadly saltwater crocodile, which they believe created the world. The Sepik people believe they're descended from crocodiles. The canoe is their link between the natural and spiritual worlds. The carved prows express this sacred connection. These scars represent the teeth marks of a crocodile, but the wounds were made by a knife. When a boy comes of age, he must undergo a ceremonial initiation. He suffers a ritual attack, and if he survives, he will possess the power of the crocodile. The people are surrounded by the sounds of the forest, the swamps, the lakes. Each voice is a spirit. To the people of New Guinea, there is no such thing as a natural death. Every death is caused by a sorcerer, an enemy, and every death has to be avenged. The Asmat people live on the southern coast of Irian Jaya. These ceremonial houses are the center of adult male life. Here they plan wars, hunting raids, and religious rituals. Their religious life once involved headhunting and cannibalism, which they practiced until just a few decades ago. The Azmat are highly skilled carvers. In the past, giant sculptures were central to the elaborate ceremonies performed to mourn the dead. The carvings were meant to incite revenge upon the agent of death. Enemies' heads were hung from these statues. The intricate carvings were never used twice. Each death required a new set of statues. Such carvings were once banned by the Indonesian government in an attempt to wipe out tradition and bring these tribes under control. But their culture is deeply rooted and their art has survived. The great variety of cultures in New Guinea reflects the diversity of the land. In many places, the dense jungles give way to an even more difficult terrain the swamps. These swamplands are vast, covering 62,000 miles. There is no soil suitable for gardening, and the small food sources have kept the population down. But one food grows here in abundance. Without it, the people could not survive the sago palm. To the azmat, the tree symbolizes a human being. Its fruit is the head, the fronds are arms, the roots legs. 
The name of the tribe, Azmat, means tree people. Azmat villagers walk through miles of swamp to check on the readiness of the sago tree. To ensure a healthy tree, they perform a long, complicated ceremony, a ceremony filmed here for the first time. They sing to the sago palm spirit, asking it to leave before they take down the tree. Until the interference of missionaries, this ceremony was conducted at the felling of every sago tree. But Christianity discouraged such rituals. The sago exorcism is now performed only once a year. For the last time, the spirit is warned away. They are not after the fruit, but the soft, crumbly pith inside the trunk. Because they believe the sago represents a human being, they use a wooden pounder carved with headhunting symbols to break apart its body. A sago palm has to grow for 20 years before it's ready for harvest. In that time, it lays down massive stores of starch, which can be extracted by pounding, washing, and drying. Eventually, it turns out just like flour and is most commonly cooked as a pancake. Because they have no agriculture, the Azmat rely on the sago for 80% of their calories. It's pure starch and provides them with plenty of energy. If people are tired of pancakes, there is another way to prepare it, as sago pudding. The water and flour congeal in an almost magical way to create a mixture with the consistency of glue. Pancakes and pudding are the staple diet, but the sago trees also offer a surprising nutritional treat. These Azmat men left behind a part of the trunk for about a month. Now they've returned for their reward. The grubs they're collecting are the larvae of the Capricorn beetle that laid its eggs in the tree after it had been chopped down. In a land with a drastic shortage of protein, these grubs make a very wholesome snack. For these men of the swamps, the passage into manhood is not easy. Throughout their history, they engaged in fierce warfare with their neighbors. It was believed that before a young boy could become a man, he needed the spirit of a man to enter him. And for that, he needed a human head. And for human heads, they formed raiding parties. 
They believed the head was like the fruit of a tree. It had the power to give seed and bring growth. If the head was placed in the lap of a young boy, it would plant within him the seeds of strength and sexual maturity. That's why the headhunting raids were once so vital to the growth of their villages. Today, the government and missionaries have put a stop to these age-old rituals. But some say the old ways are still practiced in secret. And what other secrets does this island hold? What lies beyond the coastal territories of the Azmat and Sepik people? Moving inland, we reach waters that run too fast and furiously for even the most powerful canoes. No coastal people travel here. Few strangers have penetrated this fortress of jungle, rock, and water. And at last, we reach the rugged central mountains that have guarded the interior of New Guinea from the outside world until well into this century. In our next episode, we accompany one of the first explorers to reach New Guinea's hidden heart. of the unexpected will return in just a moment. Next time on Nova, Mount Pinatubo begins to stir. These scientists are responsible for predicting whether or not this means a deadly eruption is near. Should they... Nature is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Siemens, a whole new world of ideas in electronics and electrical engineering. Siemens, precision thinking. And by Canon, quality and innovation for the way we work and live. Canon. And by the gas industry, helping provide cleaner air with clean gas energy. Europeans first set eyes on New Guinea in the 1500s, but it was not until 1930 that outsiders braved the interior. They were looking for gold. Along the way, they encountered butterflies as big as dinner plates, tree-climbing kangaroos, giant insects, and creatures so beautiful they were named birds of paradise. But on this island of mountains and ice, heat and rain, the prospectors also made another startling discovery. In their quest for gold, 
they stumbled upon a Stone Age culture, one of the last to be discovered by the modern world. Voices echo in these forests, voices strange and unexpected. They belong to animals found nowhere else but in New Guinea, the great island just north of Australia. Because of its isolation, everything on it has evolved in unique ways. New Guinea is the largest tropical island in the world, but there are no monkeys or apes here. Instead, kangaroos climb the treetops. This is a good fellow's tree kangaroo, the most brightly colored of its kind. Kangaroos, which live on the ground, depend on their powerful hind legs for getting around and for defense. But a life in the trees means these kangaroos have developed very strong front claws. They're essential for grasping the bark as they forage for leaves and fruit. Their docile, quiet appearance belies their ferocity when threatened. Tree kangaroos have been known to kill hunting dogs with one swipe of their heavy razor claws, crushing the dog's snout or ripping open its stomach. Since their favorite foods grow right under their noses and since they have no real predators, tree kangaroos have no incentive to polish their tree climbing skills they can afford to be clumsy. This is a Doria's tree kangaroo with a joey in her pouch. Doria's tree kangaroo is the largest marsupial on the island. The males weigh more than 50 pounds. The surrounding sea has kept out not only primates, but many other mammals as well. These are the feet of the most dangerous animal to stalk the forest. A flightless bird, the cassowary. It stands as tall as a person, and weighs 110 pounds. Many a man has been disemboweled by one kick from its powerful claws. Only the most skilled hunter dared stalk this formidable adversary. And if he succeeded, he proudly wore the cassowary's feathers in his headdress. The absence of large predators makes the forest floor safe for the cassowary and another striking but less formidable bird. The crowned pigeon. It's the size of a turkey, and while it can fly, it's so heavy that it rarely leaves the ground. Megapodes, too, are quite big and fly as little as possible. Their name means Bigfoot, 
because they use their feet to dig deep tunnels in which they lay their eggs. They don't sit on their eggs, but rely on the warm soil to incubate them. The ground is continually heated by nearby volcanic springs. Because there are so few predators here, megapode eggs are left unprotected, but they are not completely safe. Human beings are the major threat to their eggs. Papua New Guineans are expert farmers and hunters, but megapode eggs are especially valued. In a land where protein is scarce, these eggs, because of their size, are more coveted than the eggs of other birds. Wrapping them in palm leaves ensures a safe journey back to the village. Because megapodes breed for nine months of the year, the people can collect their eggs three times a week. Their annual harvest is nearly a million eggs. The megapode population may not be able to withstand such a harvest indefinitely. These people and the unique wildlife that surrounds them live in one of the last untouched rainforests in the world. In the late 1800s, the age of exploration, New Guinea was still virgin territory. Its climate, its harsh terrain, its hostile people, all kept outsiders away. But after expeditions had climbed the Alps, conquered the Himalayas, and penetrated the Amazon, white adventurers turned their eyes to New Guinea. The Dutch grabbed the western half of the island and the Germans, the British and the Australians fought over the rest. After establishing themselves on the coast, the Europeans began to look inland. One early naturalist spoke in awe of the place as he wrote, the very mention of being taken into the interior of New Guinea sounds like being allowed to visit the enchanted regions of the Arabian Nights. In this startling, lush, and isolated world, animal and plant life grew into wildly extreme proportions. Naturalists swarmed to New Guinea, eager to record everything. As one wrote, it's impossible to step outside without seeing something new and interesting. One thing that was interesting was the size of these new creatures. This stick is really an insect, almost 12 inches long. One foot from wingtip to wingtip, the Hercules moth is the biggest moth in the world. Bird-wing butterflies also glide on giant wings. With a wingspan of 10 inches, they're the world's largest butterflies. But what transfixed the naturalists were the bird voices they heard throughout the forest. And one only had to look up to see a profusion of color, a rainbow lorikeet, a great cuckoo dove, 
The natives believed if one dreamed of lorikeets or doves, one is dreaming of men. But to dream of women, one must have dreams of the birds of paradise. There are 38 species in the world, and most of them are found in New Guinea. All these birds are male. They're the most colorful sex because they need to attract a mate. But their dazzling colors may also warn potential predators that they're poisonous. New Guinea is the only place on Earth where scientists have discovered deadly toxins on a bird's feathers. These lesser birds of paradise are displaying on a communal tree. The dull brown female flies in and out, sizing up her possible suitor. She chooses the best performer as her mate. Usually, the first chosen male makes 90% of all matings in that season. New Guineans believe a woman's soul changes into a bird of paradise. The birds are black and brown, the color of a woman's skin. The display plumes are like skirts, and the new plumes are beautiful, like a young girl. That is why dreaming of birds of paradise is to dream of women. the sun sets, the island's most unusual and secretive animals awaken. The spotted couscous, a possum, has a surprisingly colorful coat for an animal that only emerges after dark. Once, New Guinea was connected to Australia, and that means there's a wide variety of marsupials stranded on this island, up in trees or living on the ground. This ground couscous spends the day hiding in a hollow tree and has now emerged in search of a snack. It eats insects but prefers fruit. In fact, the females have been known to carry fruit back to their dens in their pouches. Most of the marsupials here are slightly different from their Australian relatives because these marsupials are adapted to survive in rainforest, which is rare in Australia. This is a wallaby, one of six species unique to New Guinea. All of them are small and dainty, so they can move with ease through the undergrowth on the forest floor. This looks like an ordinary mouse, but it too is a marsupial. It's a spiny echimipira, a type of tiny bandicoot. It feeds on almost anything from earthworms to fallen fruit. Other forest animals are more particular about what they eat. 
this tiny sugar glider lives on a sweet liquid diet of sap and nectar. Feeding sites are usually spread far apart, so to get to them, the sugar glider sails from tree to tree. Some of the native people are wary of the sugar glider. They believe sorcerers transformed themselves into this animal to spy on their victims. When feasting on the blossoms of a eucalyptus tree, sugar gliders pick up pollen on their fur. As they move to another tree, they pollinate it. But the most numerous pollinators are bats, a blossom bat searching for nectar in a banana flower. Bats arrived from Asia by flying, but many mammals, including carnivores, weren't able to cross the sea. So some of the most significant predators are snakes. A brown cat snake. Another night creature, a land crab. In most of New Guinea, rain falls constantly, soaking everything. Explorers not only suffered from the heat, but could only travel at a snail's pace as they slid and tumbled through the mossy undergrowth. These humid conditions, however, are ideal for land crabs, and New Guinea is crawling with them. Land crabs scavenge vegetable matter from the forest floor, and their diet serves them well. Some grow to the size of footballs. Almost completely terrestrial, they travel to the sea only once a year to lay eggs. In the 1930s, Papua New Guinea was still a territory of Australia. Its colonial governor was determined to explore all the uncharted areas in his domain. So he sent out small patrols to scout this unknown region. The area they had to cover was a blank place on the map, the size of South Carolina. At the same time, gold prospectors were braving the journey inland in hopes of making their fortunes. Australian Mick Leahy was one of them. Young and robust, he was undaunted by the challenges of these formidable jungles, although he knew they were dangerous. He wrote in his journal, we saw a young chap come down the opposite side of the river. We thought he would cross the river on the swing bridge. We walked to greet him. By the time we reached the river, he had disappeared. 
His dog, wet and battered, was found downriver. No trace was ever found of the young chap's body. A person making a first crossing who did not know the strength of New Guinea's streams could step into the river and be immediately engulfed and swept away. Water has been a major force in shaping this island's dramatic landscape. This is karst, a type of limestone that has been partially dissolved, creating vertical walls and jagged spires. Early explorers called these limestone cliffs a universe of death. One patrol took 10 and a half hours to go a mere 300 yards. The patrol leader wrote, it's a frightful stretch of country. The rock stands on end and forms craters large and small, and every step has to be watched, for the limestone edges are as sharp as broken glass. After 10 days of grueling travel, the patrol's rations ran out. Just in time, the limestone gave way to a less treacherous terrain. They found an underground cave filled with bats and gratefully devoured them. The patrols never canvassed all of this forbidding territory. Even today, many of these rocky strongholds remain completely unexplored. This region is called the Highlands, a stretch of mountains which cuts through the heart of New Guinea for a thousand miles. In 1930, Mick Leahy was the first to penetrate these peaks. He was on a quest for gold, but he discovered much more. He hired coastal natives to carry guns, medicines, and most importantly, a 16 millimeter movie camera. This historic footage is the first glimpse of the interior of New Guinea. The terrain proved even more difficult than expected. They scaled one ridge only to find another, crossing mountain after mountain. After days of tough travel, they looked across a valley and were startled at what they saw. The valley was filled with gardens and pinpoints of light. And people, tens of thousands of people. The prospectors had unwittingly stumbled upon the last great unknown culture of the modern world. Through the gift of the camera, we're able to see a people encountering the outside world for the first time. To people who used stone tools, who had never seen metal, who didn't know what a wheel was, these newcomers brought a whole wealth of treasures with them. The New Guineans call the white men, men of all things. Leahy showed them a wind-up gramophone. I'm looking on the bright side, so I'm walking in the shade. The people thought the gramophone was a box full of ghosts. And having no previous experience of white skin, they also believed the Australians themselves were spirits. 
probably ghosts of their own ancestors and therefore friendly. On the bright side, those are days all care and strife. I can wear a grin. But on later visits, the Highlanders were less in awe of strangers, and the prospectors feared for their lives. They frequently used their guns to demonstrate their destructive strength. Although Leahy was one of the more enlightened of the European invaders, his unit still managed to kill almost 50 of the Highlanders. Other explorers had no such humanitarian compunctions. They felt they could only make it through the jungle by killing their way through. The native people retaliated by attacking all newcomers, earning a reputation for ferocity. In spite of outside influence, the fierce Highland people maintain their traditional lifestyle to this day. These are the Dani, the last major Highland tribe to be discovered in New Guinea. They live in the western half of the island in the Indonesian province of Irian Jaya. The Indonesians tried to force them to give up their traditions, including their unusual penis sheaths. But the Dani refused. This dance celebrates victory in a tribal dispute. One of the most warlike tribes lives on the eastern side of the highlands. Deep in the forest, smoke rises from the homesteads of the Huli people. Like all highland people, they construct houses that are deliberately low to the ground. This enables a small fire to keep the building and its occupants warm during chilly mountain nights. Huli husbands live separately from their wives in a communal men's house. During the evening hours, they socialize and fashion tools from local materials. <laughs> Within the living memory of these men, stone axes were the best available too. Great care was taken to make such a simple yet highly effective instrument. Today they are still made but for a different purpose. Remnants of the Stone Age have attracted the modern world and stone axes are made to sell to tourists. <laughs> <laughs> Male solidarity is strong among Huli men. They keep their interactions with women at a minimum. Too much contact is considered potentially dangerous to a man. In this region where fighting is constant, training in the arts of war is their major preoccupation. The Huli also cultivated another form of art. With simple wooden and stone tools, they created a most sophisticated system of agriculture. They built rolling terraces and perfectly square gardens on the steep slopes of their mountain world. One impressed patrol officer wrote, below us, reaching as far as the eye could see, lay the rolling timbered slopes of a huge valley system. On every slope were cultivated squares of such mathematical exactness, I thought of wheat fields. There is archaeological evidence that gardening began here 10,000 years ago. That would make New Guineans among the first farmers on Earth.
The main food crops were probably sago, coconut, and banana. The European introduction of sweet potato revolutionized life in the highlands. These Huli women are digging for its tubers. Sweet potato grows in abundance in these poor, cold soils and has become a staple. <laughs> the success of the sweet potato has enabled the people to raise more livestock. The population of the highlands has boomed. Some people are moving out of the mountains and into the coastal cities. The downtown marketplace overflows with all kinds of fruits and vegetables. Foods from nearby forests also add to the variety. Karuka nuts and marita fruit are from different species of wild palm trees. A pig in one's garden is like having money in the bank. Pigs have long been prized in the highlands. They're a source of wealth, status, and bargaining power. The pigs are owned by men, but it's always their wives who look after them, and the care is extremely thorough. During the day, the pigs accompany the women to work in the gardens, and even at night, they remain by their sides. These women share their own homes with the pigs, while their husbands sleep in their communal house. The evening meal is roasted sweet potato to be shared among all the members of the household, human and animal alike. Since pigs are so highly valued, maintaining this capital investment is crucial to each household. In fact, no man could marry without a gift of several pigs to his prospective father-in-law. As with all investments, there comes a time to cash in. The pig is not butchered as food for its owners, but is to be given away to settle a serious debt. These men have recently fought a war with their neighbors. In many areas, tribal warfare is still common. Payback killings perpetuate an endless cycle of fighting. In this case, enemy warriors were killed and their comrades want compensation, or they've threatened to retaliate. The payment is carried towards a neutral no man's land for the transaction to take place. Behind the pork barrers are warriors. They're heavily armed. They take no chances when meeting with their enemies who are also carrying lethal weapons. The enemy tribe stops at the exchange site where the pork has been laid out. Oh, 
One wrong move could ignite another battle. The payment is carefully counted out to avoid any argument. They have accepted their reward and rush in for the take. Highland clans settle their own disputes. It's been difficult to police these people according to Western laws. Compensation ceremonies are common in settling everything, from wars to adultery, even car crashes. These days, the payments may involve cash or crates of beer, but pigs are still the commodity most valued, partly because they're a good excuse for a feast. <laughs> the Huli men have brought with them another prized possession, headdresses made from exquisite bird feathers. Only the most experienced men are allowed to make these ceremonial feather wigs, and only then by following strict customs. The headdresses are believed to offer ancestral ghosts a permanent place to reside. The headdresses are an integral part of the men's lives, and these warriors often travel far from their homes to obtain the necessary feathers from the birds of paradise. This is a blue bird of paradise. In the early morning, its calls to attract a mate ring through the trees, making it easy to find. The male king of Saxony has extraordinary feathers sprouting from behind its ears. He's a cautious bird, difficult to catch, which makes his plumes even more treasured by the hunters. A brown sicklebill bird of paradise. Not long ago, hunters would enter the forest in the early morning fog. They would set traps, then lie in wait in blinds with their bows and arrows. They believed if they shot a bird with its feathers already damaged, it must have dreamt it was going to die. So it spoiled its own plumage in preparation for death. These long plumes of the ribbon-tailed astropia are still especially coveted. It has a longer tail for its body size than any other bird. Just as the birds up here are different from those on the coast, the forests in the highlands are markedly different from their lower counterparts. Drops of water dance on the breeze, drenching everything with moisture. Branches are overgrown with greenery. A single large tree may support well over 300 other plant species. Some of them are orchids, which do especially well in the clammy conditions.
The higher up, the colder it gets. At nighttime, the temperatures can drop to freezing. Marsupials are active after dark, and those that live here are well adapted to the cold. This silky couscous has much thicker fur than its lowland relatives. An old native legend holds that this strange mammal could transform into an even stranger one, the long-beaked echidna. This is a mammal, but it also lays eggs. It's related to the only other mammal to lay eggs, the duck-billed platypus. It's spiny like the hedgehog, but the spines are covered in dense insulating fur. The long-beaked echidna is a throwback to the old age of the marsupials. Snuffling along, looking for worms, it's unaware that it's out of step with the rest of the world. The thick carpet of moss hides beetles, but the striped possum has no trouble sniffing them out. Striped like a skunk, it can also produce a strong, noxious odor when threatened. It has a long tongue, perfect for removing larvae from nooks and crannies. This one has found a meal in a fallen log a beetle grub. Much of the world first heard of New Guinea by an account from Captain J.A. Lawson in 1875. By this time, Europe was already jaded with the accounts of its voyagers and could only be aroused by news of the extraordinary. Lawson traveled around New Guinea for seven months and soon afterward published a book. In it, he boasted of making more earth-shattering discoveries than anyone else in his day. He raved over his discovery of the highest mountain in the world, 4,000 feet higher than Everest, of waterfalls 900 feet wide and lakes 30 miles across. He also raved over spiders as big as dinner plates, of huge apes, striped cats, even bison. Captain Lawson described ferns with black fronds and trees measuring 84 feet around. There were giant crimson lilies that left their perfume on a person for hours on end. To top it off, he claimed New Guinea was covered with daisies the size of sunflowers. In his day, no one could dispute him, and although later explorers were able to dismiss his accounts as a hoax, in some ways he did capture the mystery of the extraordinary plant and animal life that lives on this island. In fact, the truth has exceeded anyone's imagination. In the quiet woodlands, a black-throated honey eater takes nectar from an umbrella tree. Another elusive bird lives only in these woodlands, the McGregor's bird of paradise, never before filmed. In these high altitudes, there are even parrots. 
like these plum-faced lorikeets. But much farther up lay the last great challenge. New Guinea's mountains are bold, intimidating, and draw explorers like a magnet. But after many failed attempts, some explorers realize they aren't made of iron and that it takes great strength and willpower to make it into the clouds. The ultimate conquest is New Guinea's highest mountain, Mount Jaya. At more than 16,000 feet, it's the highest peak between the Andes and the Himalayas. Native people don't journey up to the glaciers. They believe if they do, they will become blind, their noses and ears will fall off, and their teeth will break into pieces in their mouths. But Westerners aren't so easily deterred. Eventually, some do fulfill their dream of making it to the top. Those who dream of finding a fortune in minerals are not disappointed either. New Guinea is rich in gold, silver, and copper. This used to be a mountain, but now it's leveled, becoming the world's fifth most productive copper mine. It's called Akhtedi. In this remote region, the 20th century has thrust itself into a Stone Age world. Giant trucks, each weighing more than 100 tons, flatten what was once a pristine landscape. Thirty tons of rock are lifted out in a single scoop. 150,000 tons of mountainside disappear every day. This massive engineering project is hugely profitable. Octeti has earned Papua New Guinea over 40% of its total export earning. More and more, these mines encroach on native people's homes and land. Sometimes the people rebel and stall the progress of these mines. But the lure for minerals is too strong, and outsiders continue to flood in. The new arrivals to this island brought even more cultures and languages. But most importantly, they brought air travel. Helicopters and planes have been the major force in opening up the highlands. They bridge together the old world with the new instantly. Air transport is the only sure way to get through New Guinea's jungles and mountains. And there are nearly 500 airports. In just one generation, the native people have found themselves confronting a modern technical society. New Guineans try to maintain their own lifestyles and traditions while faced with the wealth and power of the newcomers. In a broad sweep, Western influence has tried to change their customs, their religion, even the face of their land. For the young especially, it is a terrible struggle to choose between the newfound wealth and ancient traditions.
Today, thousands of Highlanders have come out of the mountains and into the coastal cities. And for the first time, people from the coast are meeting people from the interior. Despite all these changes, many still retain the customs and rituals which so intrigued Mick Leahy 50 years ago. It was the airplane that enabled Leahy to make his fortune. Mick Leahy found some gold, but not the mother load he was looking for. Instead, he and his brothers turned to raising coffee in the Highlands and made millions. He had three children with Highland women, but finally settled down with a European wife. The decades since Leahy's first visit have not been enough to fully explore New Guinea. This island still holds secrets. New Guinea has given us a great gift the ability to witness progressive change over thousands of years in a single instant, of seeing ancient Stone Age life and modern day existence in just a blink of the eye. The heart of this island not only reveals a living museum of natural history, but an unparalleled view of our human history as well. Nature is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Siemens, a whole new world of ideas in electronics and electrical engineering. Siemens, precision thinking. And by Canon, quality and innovation for the way we work and live. Canon. And by the gas industry, helping provide clean... Next Monday night, join us as nature takes you inside the unpredictable world of Gorilla, King of the Congo. And stay tuned now for Gospel, a concert film featuring James Cleveland, Walter Hawkins, and the Hawkins family. That's coming up next on TV 12.